Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This new podcast has been downloaded over 1.5 million times over the last five months, thanks to listeners like you. Next week, we'll be launching season two of the podcast, bringing you more evidence and experience about a broader range of topics, including but not limited to COVID-19. This week, we're checking in with people we interviewed in some of our most powerful episodes from season one. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Monica Shock Spana, an expert on the mental health effects of the novel coronavirus. We speak about the challenge of the new resurgence in cases for our psychological well being, as well as a new report about what's needed for a safe and effective vaccine to be widely and broadly accepted. Let's listen. Dr. Shakspana, thanks so much for coming back to the podcast. When we spoke a couple months ago, you were uh, the first person to talk about the mental health consequences of the coronavirus pandemic. At that time, we were facing uh, major shutdowns. There was enormous anxiety about what would happen. Um, and uh, many of the things that you spoke about and the concerns that you have have come to pass in terms of very uh, high levels of stress that people are experiencing and the uh, experiences of caregivers and people most at risk. What, what as you think about where we are, what, what's happened in, in terms of uh, the mental health outlook right now? Well, from a general population perspective, there's certainly the the stress of um, the threat of illness and the threat of death, the interruption of social relationships and economic activity. Certainly that was weighing heavily on everyone, but the sense was if we st- if we stick to our guns, we'll get some relief. And sadly, what we're seeing is given an uneven response and and also the course of the disease, we're facing the prospect and some group, some jurisdictions are already experiencing the need to return to more intense non-pharmaceutical interventions. So the release that folks were hoping for, given their protracted physical distancing, among other things. So I, I think that additional wave of the sense that more of the same is coming and perhaps relief isn't right around the corner. So in other words, it was the hope of getting past this that got people through the last set of challenges. And now if that hope is starting to evaporate, that creates a whole new problem. Right. Um, That's a good way of putting it, Josh. I think one thing that is coming up in the public discourse is, is the promise of what a safe and effective vaccine or set of vaccines offers people, which is the ability to hopefully return to work sooner, to resume worship and resume contact with one's family and friends with the protection of a, of a vaccine. Right, but it, it's not quite that simple. No, no, it's not. With regard to vaccines, of course, there's the, the biological technical challenge, right, of, of producing, producing the product. But then we have the social challenge of whether a clinically successful vaccine is, is going to be accepted by everyone. Um, and that we, we see some challenges in that case as well. So let's talk about that a little more because I know you've uh, led a comprehensive report on this question. It's one thing to hope for sort of a magic wand of a vaccine uh, to come in and save us from the situation we're in, but it's another to really plan for what can be done to realize the potential of a vaccine to save lives. So on the list of like actual challenges, uh, what do you have? Well, we've got the scientists working away. We've got the operational planners thinking about uh, things like um, distribution from a more social and psychological perspective, we also need to consider 
population uptake. That is, will will people accept uh, the vaccine? And in that case, we've got some challenges in terms of risks and benefits or perceived risks and benefits of the vaccine. We've got a focus on expedited science and and a, a sense of urgency about a vaccine, which can be hope hopeful, as you were talking about earlier, it instills hope. At the same time, it can also trigger concern that perhaps we're moving a little too quickly and uh, wouldn't that mean compromising safety in some way? So in other words, a vaccine might come about and people might be really excited about a vaccine and then when it's right there in front of them, they go, okay, 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 let's take a look at this. Oh, absolutely. Again. And if you look at our response to the pandemic influenza in 2009, where we had a vaccine for the uh, pandemic strain of influenza virus. Uh, Same old technology, just a a new strain, which was uh, rolled into uh, the vaccine. And because that vaccine was produced under a sense of urgency, that did trigger in some people's minds that, well, did we rush this rush this out a little too quickly? And is it unsafe? Even though there, it wasn't a novel technology, it, it was um, had the same safety guards as any seasonal influenza uh, vaccine. And so that perception, however, kept people from accepting that vaccine. And we could be facing that similar situation now. And then there's also the question of just, how do I get it? And how do you get it to people? Absolutely. These these are not just questions of perception, uh, mindsets, and values. It's plain old practicality. Is it affordable? Is it going to be easy to access? Or do I have to take off time from work and lose wages? Or do I have to find a child care provider? And that's going to cost me money. So there are practicalities that are about access. So COVID-19 vaccination program planners really need to think through, can people get it? It isn't just an issue of do they want it. It's also a matter of convenience and accessibility. Now, I'm guessing you think it might be not a good idea to wait till we have a safe and effective vaccine to start thinking about these challenges. Good point. And right now we have the gift of time. Right. Um, So we can take some proactive steps to help increase the likelihood that people will accept and be able to get access to a safe and effective vaccine. And so we need to learn those practical impediments that would keep people from accessing a vaccine. So if it's an issue of location, can planners think about both traditional and non-traditional places where people can go to get vaccinated that would be convenient. So there's those distribution planning uh, or distribution strategies that have to be developed. On the issue of potential vaccine hesitancy, we need to talk to people about their misgivings and try and understand what would what would inhibit them from accepting a vaccine and try and understand their point of view. And while exhibiting empathy, also sharing salient information that would inform their decision-making. And so they would take us up on the offer of a new vaccine. And what do you think the role of state and local um, health officials and uh, governments is in, in this process? Is this all something that'll come out of the federal government, you think? State and local, health officials and their community partners are going to be the ones that make this happen. Certainly guidance at the national level is going to be absolutely critical around allocation strategies and coordination of distribution and movement of supply. But the front lines are are managed by state and local health officials and their partners. And it's going to be important that uh, the community has input into local strategies for uh, allocation and distribution that are meaningful on the ground. So let me ask you what your worst case scenario is or what a bad case scenario is, then I'll ask you the good one. So worst case scenario, um, with both of them with a safe and effective vaccine. We have a safe and effective vaccine, but 
it hasn't been well explained. You know, so t- walk me through what you're worried about. Well, a worst case scenario is we'll have safe and effective vaccine that nobody wants. And not only that, relative to a COVID-19 specific vaccine, we'll also have people put off, being put off vaccines in general, if they feel there's been any compromise in our, or perceived compromise in our institutions about producing and deploying um, vaccines. So we could inadvertently hurt vaccinations more broadly if the COVID-19 vaccination program doesn't go well, but that's an absolute worst case scenario. It's not just we have excess vaccine, we could also create a version, enhance a version to vaccines more generally. Now, let's talk about a better scenario. Again, we have a safe and effective vaccine, but instead of so much confusion that people are, don't wanna get vaccinated and they start to distrust vaccines, that's the worst case scenario. In this other world, there's been better planning, it's been better explained, and how, how does it look when we roll that out? And I wanna first point out, this isn't magical thinking. Good planning can actually bring us about. So this isn't just fantasy here, Josh. So if, if we have health authorities working with commu- community-based groups and, and other non-traditional partners like businesses, we can move vaccine out in a way that is meaningful to people, um, that is convenient for people, and we, we have good uptake. If we reach underserved, marginalized populations that have not been well served in the past around vaccines or other kinds of public health interventions, but we do right by them in this context, we're going to enhance their trust and also have them look forward to a future partnership with public health in general. If we do right by this vaccination program in which all of us could benefit um, from the vaccine either directly or indirectly, we could have a revitalization of public value or public embracing of vaccines more generally. So there, and we could have enhanced literacy around vaccines, what they mean for us as a society, how they're produced and how they're kept safe. Well, so there's a lot at stake. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining me, uh, giving me an update on the work that you've been doing. Your report, I know, is at the Center for Health Security website at Johns Hopkins. And I I hope that your recommendations are taken and we are uh, able to not only develop a safe and effective vaccine, but get it to people and save lives. Great. Thanks for having me, Josh. Good to see you again. Thank you for listening to Public Health on Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamare Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen-McCusker and Spencer Greer, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.